Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to welcome you all to the College of Humanities and Social Sciences in procession at Hamad bin Khalifa University for the academic year 2023 and 2024. Uh, my name is Jolene Domingo. I'm the admissions and student affairs officer at the college, and I'm thrilled to have the chance to greet you all today and hope the event will prove to be informative and assist you in your academic path. Our sessions today aims to connect you with the faculty members of the college to explore the unique academic and research opportunities and learn more about the admissions requirements and student life. Our session is meant to include the following. So first, we're gonna um, show the agenda. Uh, we will show you the short video experiences of our students' life, college overview, and then we will talk about the academic overview that has three parts starting with translation and interpreting studies department programs, Middle Eastern studies department programs, PhD in humanities and social sciences, and then we will move on to admissions and applications requirements, and last but not least, the Q&A session. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that all lines will be muted until the end of the session. If you have any questions you would like to ask, please share them using the Q&A tab on the lower side of the WebEx screen by clicking on the three dots. Please direct these questions to all panelists to make sure that your questions are visible to all of us. We will address as many as we can during the Q&A session. So, um, Riman, can you show the student experience video now? Human, I believe there's no sound. My name is Noor Al-Khawari and I'm an alumni of HBKU and I have a MA degree in Women's Society and Development. I believe in women's rights and throughout the program in the past two years I was able to understand what feminism really is, engage with it and understand what women's rights really means in this region. After that I was able to grow a broader understanding of what feminism is. I don't consider uh, HBKU only helped me for, mo for my job only, but also shaped me for who am I today. As an employee at Qatar University and as an alumni of HBKU, I'm able to share my experiences and knowledge with whoever I sit with. And as an alumni and as an employee, I encourage all women to leave their comfort zone and experience what the world has to have. Because if they do not do that, then the world doesn't know that women are able to do everything. نيفين الخواجة خريجة برنامج ماجستير الترجمة في جامعة حمد بن خليفة أتح لي فرصة وفتح لي الأبواب للدخول إلى عالم الإعلام كنت أخذ مقرر الترجمة الإعلامية وكان يقدمها البروفيسور دكتور أشرف عبد الفتاح وهو كان مترجم فوري في قناة الجزيرة أعمل حاليا مذيعة في قسم الأخبار بتلفزيون قطر الرسمي أيضا أقوم بعمل تقارير داخلية أو ميدانية وتعلمت أيضا على أيدي المنتجين والمحررين هنا في تلفزيون قطر من أصحاب الخبرة في القنوات الذين التي قدموا منها 
كل يوم انا اتعلم خاصه في التغطيات المناسبات مثل اليوم الوطني مثل افتتاح مكتبه قطر الوطنيه اكون سعيده في ان اشارك في تغطيه مثل هذه التغطيات التي يعني تعبر عن التطور وتعبر عن النهضه التي وصلنا لها واكون انا سعيده اني كنت جزء في تغطيات مثل هذه الاحداث Hamadi head of uh, programs production in uh, the program directorates in uh, Al Jazeera News Channel. I graduated from the Digital Humanities and Societies program. I was very much interested in uh, jumping into that field to learn more about uh, our societies and uh, uh, how do they actually function. But you know, it turned out that the major is much more than that. The classes are not the normal or regular classes that you would think that we would have where there is a lecturer just giving a lecture with a PowerPoint presentation and leaves. We did experiment with podcasting or with creating websites or with uh, working on timelines or with uh, working on graphics, utilizing all the skills that we have to infuse them within the major itself. And that was actually something very interesting and impressive regarding the curriculum of the major in here. Without further ado, let's start the session by inviting Dr. Stephen Wright, Associate Dean for Student Affairs, uh, to speak about the college. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Charlene, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, so the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, um, we are a community of, of um, we are a community which focuses on interdisciplinary learning and research. And our programs have a, have a social um, are oriented towards having impact within the society. And this is something that you're going to see from my colleagues as they present their programs. Uh, the nature of the college overall is that we focus in terms of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary inquiry, and we have a, 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 a well-established reputation internationally in terms of key fields dealing with translation, languages, um, women's studies, digital humanities, um, amongst others. And I think what you'll find is that the nature of the programs will be able to give you a very rewarding experience, but also you'll become part of a, a much broader community, a community in which you'll be able to find that um, our graduates have moved on to some incredible areas um, of employment uh, in future destinations. So you'll be joining that alumni network by, um, by going throughout our uh, college. Um, so if I move to the next slide, um, what I want to talk to you about now is the structure of the college. And in, this, in the college itself, um, what's interesting about it is that we also have a translation and interpreting institute uh, within the college. And this is what the, the college was built around uh, initially. And within that, we have our own language center um, we, and also a translation and training center. But we, um, beyond that, we also have <clears throat> three main programs in that field, which are in translation studies, audiovisual translation, and also our newer program in intercultural communication. But beyond that, the, uh, we have a Department of Middle Eastern Studies, which has a degree in women's society and development and digital humanities and societies. And these are ones which focus on the contemporary challenges uh, facing the region. And then to cap it off, we also have our own PhD program, which is interdisciplinary in scope. And my colleagues will tell you more details about um, the nature of those programs. So in the next slide, um, in summary, the uh, college has five um, uh, master's programs plus one PhD. We are a very diverse community in that uh, we have more than 27 different nationalities within the college and around about 100 students. But I think more, more than that, it's the faculty itself that we actually have because the faculty are all highly engaged in research and leaders in their own field as well. So the key aspect that this college will be able to provide you is, is that the, it is research-led teaching. So you, the research that the faculty um, in their disciplines will infuse that into the curriculum and into the classroom setting. So I think by joining this college, you'll have a very rewarding experience and one which will um, 
really establish you as part of a community of scholars as well. Um, so in the next slide, um, I'll um, just talk a little bit about the academic resources and uh, aspects of the college. So one of the key added value aspects of the CHSS is that we have our own academic resources center, which essentially is a subject specialist library uh, within the college. And we're the only college in HPKU that actually has that. We have our own subject specialist librarian, so that there's someone there to help you um, in the discipline that you focus on to get the right resources, to get the right um, learning experience um, that will really uh, give you uh, an edge um, as, as, as you progress in your degree. But we also want to make sure that you're successful. So that's why we have our own academic writing and research excellence center. Um, and this is where you, you'll be able to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, our specialists to provide you that level of support. Key thing is, this is something which the college provides in addition to the university. So really we emphasize uh, those opportunities. And also we have our own language center, which offers 13 languages. So you can even do it, you can even try and take a language, uh, additional language uh, while you're doing your degree as well. So overall, we aim to provide a very enriching experience in the college and one that will aim for you to get um, to achieve your maximum potential. So in the next slide, um, I'll uh, just uh, hand it back to Charlene and then uh, thank you very much. We'll look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Stephen, for that insightful information. Now let's move on to the academic overview of the translation and interpreting studies department programs, which will be presented by Dr. Dimer for MA in audiovisual translation and Dr. Rissam for MA in translation studies and MA in intercultural communication. Let's begin with Dr. Ramer. Dr. Ramer. Thank you so much, um, Charlene. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to present the MA program in audiovisual translation. Um, before I start, I would like uh, to mention a couple of points that I always uh, mention. Uh, the first point is the program is very unique in nature. It is the first and the only MA program in audiovisual translation, not only in Qatar, but also in the MENA region. Also, the program is accredited by the University of Geneva, which is one of the best academic institutions that teach translation studies and the program was therefore awarded the FTI label of equality, which has given it an international prestige and visibility. Now, as you know, audiovisual translation is everywhere. We are surrounded by screens and we consume these services on a daily basis, whether we like it or, uh, or not, by different outlets, uh, TVs, cinemas, museums, and uh, other online outlets, such as Netflix and YouTube. However, and unfortunately, there is a limited number of qualified ABT specialists in the region who possess adequate knowledge and technical skills that would allow them to produce excellent quality work. And this is exactly why the MA in Audiovisual Translation at Hamad bin Khalifa University is striving to graduate an increasing number of ABT specialists who are equipped with technical knowledge and um, skills that would allow them to improve the quality of services in the region and expand the research and academic components related to audiovisual translation. Um, as you know, if you have a look at the structure of the program, we have uh, 39 credit hours and uh, the program is two year full time program and three year part time program. And if we move to the next slide, we will talk about the uh, the courses we have. So in the first semester, uh, students are introduced to three core courses. These are Arabic stylistics, pragmatic translation, and introduction to translation theories. And later in the second semester, students are introduced to uh, the different branches of audiovisual translation. And these include subtitling, voicing and accessibility which we have which we have um, heavily invested in and it includes subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing and audio description for the blind and visually impaired now in the second year students get the opportunity to specialize in one or more specialized i mean uh, one or two branches of audiovisual translation and this is why we have advanced subtitling uh, advanced dubbing and uh, uh, accessibility or intersensory translation for access. Now, in addition to these courses, uh, students get the opportunity to have an internship 
uh, either in-house or elsewhere in the industry, during which they, wor they work on uh, genuine material usually obtained from ABT companies, media outlets, and academic institutions. Um, also, students are always encouraged to participate or, um, you know, participate in various outreach projects. And a very good example here is the participation of our students and alumni in a Jail Film Festival, during which they work on generating uh, accessible versions of uh, selected films that include subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, audio description, and sign language uh, interpretation. Um, finally, our students complete their program by writing a thesis of, on a topic of their own choice. And I have to say that our students have um, tackled issues that helped a lot in advancing the knowledge in the field of audiovisual translation in the Arab world. So, as you can see, the program is practical and theoretical at the same time, and uh, it would qualify our students to secure a job in the industry, pursue their PhD uh, study, or uh, simply become active researchers on topics related to translation in general and audiovisual translation in particular. So this is briefly what we offer our students in the uh, Masters of Audiovisual Translation uh, program. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions uh, at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amr, for that valuable information. Now let's move on to the academic overview of the MA in Translation Studies and Intercultural Communication to be presented by Dr. Wissam Abdul-Jabbar. Dr. Wissam. Thank you, Charlene. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this open session. Um, my name is Wissam Abdul-Jabbar. I'm faculty in intercultural communication. So I will present the Master of Arts in Translation Studies and the Master of Arts in Intercultural Communication. Uh, but before we go into the specifics of each program, I would like to quickly highlight that both programs have a joint structure and some joint characteristics um, as well. Um, the first thing is that there are two year programs, unless you do it part time, and then in that case, it takes you about three years to finish. The second thing um, that I'd like to draw your attention to is that the curriculum is 39 credit hours, meaning that you would be with us every afternoon from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, from Sunday to Wednesday. Uh, Thursday will be busy, you know, Thursday afternoons are reserved for the many exciting events organized across programs in the college and in Education City um, at large. Um, so, um, I would also like to stress that all the programs um, of the translation and interpreting studies department address the key challenges faced by the humanities and social sciences in our increasingly globalized uh, societies. So, for example, uh, one question comes to mind, how knowledge is produced and circulated uh, across languages, cultures, and territories, uh, be them digital or physical. Now, the second aspect that is um, particular to these programs uh, is that they involve students in the very practice of interlinguistic and intercultural communication across contexts, settings, and audiences. Uh, we do that to um, sharpen our students' communication skills and to develop an understanding of the complexities um, of creating and sharing knowledge, ideas, concepts, emotions, um, and again, you know, across languages and, and cultures as well. So let me now um, turn to the specifics of, of each program within this joint framework. So for, um, for the Masters of Arts in Translation Studies, this is uh, the um, first of its kind in, in Qatar because it prepares students to perform translation across multiple contexts of, of work, which really shaped the language industry in, in, in Qatar and beyond. So, for instance, you know, the, there's the, the media, um, trade, the legal and financial sector, as well as literature. In the second year, students will develop the translation skills needed. Um, and that, you know, the, they are. That is necessary and, and, and common, uh, of course, in, in, in all contexts. Um, and, and then in the second year, our students will specialize in the areas they are interested in. So in that sense, it's uh, very personalized in, in, that, um, in that manner. 
And to enable this, candidates, you know, students need to come up with the linguistic skills in English and Arabic. And that's also the case for the audiovisual translation program, you know, of course, needless to say. Um, these linguistic skills will be further developed. Uh, so, you know, you're not really starting from scratch and you're being guided and helped um, through the practice of translation itself and in the, in the course that is specifically designed for this, which is called Arabic stylistics for translators. In addition to that, uh, students will learn how translation has been theorized in time and space, exp exploring, you know, um, foundational theories of, of the field and then um, open up their mind to critical approaches uh, that have emerged in the postmodern and postcolonial context as well. So, in other words, the curriculum really strives to make theory ring true to practice and vice versa. It's not just theory. It's not just practice. It's, it's both, uh, both combined. Uh, preparing graduates to live up to the standards of excellence in both industry and, and academia, and that's the ultimate goal. In this light, um, the internship comes in and the thesis, which students do in the second year, uh, these are, you know, um, springboard uh, for, for that objective. Um, the internship is done here um, in the Training Translation Center, which is a prestigious translation service provider in, in Qatar industry, and where students really benefit from the expertise of senior translators and project managers. So that's, you know, uh, hands-on experience with translators. Um, now, last but not least, because the work of translation is now increasingly mediated by technology, students also learn how to work with computer-assisted translation softwares and to develop practical but also critical understanding of the challenges and the stakes of machine translation in our increasingly globalized world, as you know. Uh, let me now turn to our uh, newborn program, um, the MA in Intercultural Communication, uh, where I teach. Uh, which actually started this academic year. Um, this is a unique program in Qatar designed to um, address the dire need for research and the complexities of intercultural business, dialogue, and for developing effective intercultural communication policies and practices in multicultural societies like Qatar. Um, so, in other words, students will therefore be prepared to know how to um, and learn how to manage communication, um, across intercultural settings um, in profit and non-profit organizations. And they will also learn how to do, um, you know, um, consulting in the public and private sectors through classes and, and through internship and to develop, of course, you know, research methods and tools um, that are um, sensitive to cultural and languages um, differences. So, to conclude, these two programs are generally characterized by uh, they're very interdisciplinary in nature. Um, there, there's this capacity to blend theory uh, with practice, and finally, uh, their capacity to train students in highly specialized skills and areas, and at the same time, um, in intercultural skills uh, that are required today. You know, of uh, critical um, citizens. Um, I'd like also to say that the degrees are in line with the market demands and have potential career paths as well. Um, thank you so much for listening and for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wissam, for your insightful overview. Now let's move on to the, uh, to the Middle Eastern Studies programs to be presented by the Director of the Middle Eastern Studies Department, Dr. Hassan Akimian. Dr. Hassan. Hello, uh, very warm welcome from a warm afternoon here in Doha. Uh, pleased to have this opportunity to present to you and introduce uh, our two flagship programs in the Department of Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, as Charlene mentioned, I'm um, the chair or director of the department, which was set up in 2017. Uh, and now we have these two programs which have uh, graduated uh, four cohorts. This year, we're looking at the fifth cohort going through uh, their second year uh, final program. And uh, altogether, we have registered uh, uh, six cohorts. These two programs are well established uh, and have a 
structure, which is very similar to what you've already heard from my colleagues in the preceding introductions. Uh, they're both uh, two years uh, in full-time mode and three years if you choose to study them in part-time mode. They consist of a total 39 credit hours. The first one is MA in Women, Society and Development, as has been mentioned. The other one is the MA Digital Societies and Humanities. The other two things, the other two attributes that you have heard from every one of my colleagues that has spoken until now is, and this is another common feature of our programs in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences is impact and innovation. All our programs befit these attributes. The uh, MA Women's Society and Development and Digital Humanities are both uh, innovative in the sense that they are uh, first programs of the type, both in Qatar and designed to meet real needs in uh, Qatar and the region. The same goes for the digital humanities and societies. Um, the Women Society Development Program has been based on a, an analysis of a gap, which arises from the fact that the role of uh, the realization of the fact that the role of women in society is underappreciated and a desire to find ways of elevating the role of women. If you look at this uh, aspiration, it's built into the Qatar national vision. It is built into many other countries' uh, vision for development and, uh, of course, called SDG5. Um, the structure of the program, the strength of the faculty, uh, who are extremely uh, research active and renowned reflects precisely a firm belief in the fact that we are well placed to fill in this gap for our region and for uh, the context in which we operate. The core courses give you the foundation, uh, positing the question of the role of women uh, in society, in culture, in history, in economic and social development. Uh, the, core, the, the, the elective courses offer opportunities for you to further specialize in key areas of interest. For instance, in areas dealing with uh, women and medicine, which uh, uh, was critical in the context of the pandemic that affected the world. Uh, we offer opportunities for specialization in, in uh, art and literature, film and so on, creative industries and so on. The list goes Law and citizenship, for instance, these are just some examples. The key bridge between the first and second year is an internship, should you wish to decide to enrich your understanding uh, of the academic principles and classroom, enrich classroom environment with experiential learning. Uh, a very important part of um, both our programs, and I will come to the digital humanities in a second. In fact, let, let, let's go to the next slide. Um, the, a key uh, characteristic of both our programs is the thesis, which spans the entire two semesters in the final second year, and it accounts for something like 25% of the uh, MA. Uh, MA Digital Humanities Societies, again, a two-year program full-time, three-year if studied in part-time. It's unique. The role of uh, technology uh, digital technologies in revolutionizing daily life, but also academic and scholarly life um, in key sectors, uh, public sector, private sector, voluntary sector. Uh, this is something that uh, obviously everyone is familiar with, and it has raised tremendous challenges for all of us, whether individually or in our organizations. Digital humanities equips you to be better citizens, both in private sphere and at work, uh, career-wise, in terms of dealing with a uh, colossal amount of information you are all exposed to at minimal cost these days, thanks to the revolution in digital uh, technologies, to be able to better um, distill, analyze, process, and use that information. And the other side of the coin is, of course, to be able to distill good information from bad information, from fake news, from disinformation. And these are some key areas which our colleagues um, are involved with frontier level uh, research. Uh, another area of expertise in this department is quantitative linguistics, 
textual analysis, uh, whether of printed words, books, newspapers, and so on, but also digital uh, text uh, like websites and, of course, social media. And this is now increasingly uh, an arena in which uh, wars are fought, uh, nations' securities are put at risk, and having those skills and aptitudes is a tremendous asset also in the job market. I'll be very happy to uh, answer any questions relating to these two programs. Uh, should you have, please don't uh, hesitate to put them to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sun, for your informative overview. Now let's move on to the academic overview of the PhD program to be presented by Dr. Mehdi Riazi, Associate Dean for Research. Dr. Mehdi. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlene, and thank you, my colleagues. Um, another uh, warm welcome uh, to our participants uh, today in this information session. Um, um, whether you're attending as a PhD applicant or as a master's applicant, um, um, it's my pleasure to share with you some information about um, our PhD program, which you might be interested in. Um, you might have heard the concept of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, and the concept of interdisciplinarity, and it was uh, raised and mentioned by my colleagues uh, some, uh, a couple of times today as well. So basically, the idea uh, goes beyond uh, specific disciplines in conceptualizing and uh, addressing uh, more complex uh, problems um, and using appropriate uh, methodologies in order to um, answer uh, related uh, questions. Um, so, our PhD program is branded as interdisciplinary and as such, um, it is uh, uh, one of, uh, uh, you know, few PhD programs um, in the world uh, with, with this title, uh, PhD, uh, uh, Interdisciplinary PhD in Humanities and uh, Social Sciences. Um, so, I would like to elaborate on the interdisciplinary nature of the program. Part of it uh, would be operationalized uh, through the courses uh, that you take uh, while you will enroll in our program, uh, but the other part actually will be uh, will, will be operationalized by you yourselves as uh, potential uh, PhD students. Uh, through our core courses and electives, um, you get the opportunity to be exposed to a variety of themes and topics uh, that address uh, different aspects of humanities and social sciences, and also you become familiar with uh, the relevant uh, methodologies uh, that are used in order to address those uh, problems. In addition to courses, uh, there are uh, two milestones uh, in the journey of our PhD program. One is a qualifying exam, uh, and the other one is candidacy exam. Again, these two exams uh, provide you with ample uh, opportunity uh, to read and learn about uh, you know, broader um, issues uh, related to uh, humanities and social sciences. And finally, uh, through the dissertation project, um, you get the chance uh, to um, use the uh, philosophical as well as uh, theoretical and methodological um, underpinnings in order to tailor um, your uh, uh, project uh, into uh, uh, you know, a successful uh, PhD thesis. Um, and uh, regarding that, um, uh, being based in Education City, um, our students are uh, advantage, at advantage because, uh, number one, again, they can be uh, uh, exposed to a variety of themes and topics and ideas but also there is the possibility of uh, co-supervision uh, from uh, partner uh, universities. Um, so that's um, another advantage um, of uh, our PhD program. Regarding the structure of our PhD program, um, uh, it's a four-year 
a full-time program um, and a requirement of uh, 54 credits. Um, out of uh, these uh, 54 credits, uh, there would be 18 uh, credit hours uh, for courses, as you can see in this slide. Um, um, there are three core courses, uh, explorations in global humanities, explorations in interdisciplinary or interdisciplinarity, and uh, doctoral independent study. In addition to these three core courses, there are uh, three electives that, uh, in consultation uh, with uh, supervisors. The students uh, enroll in those electives in order to expand uh, their uh, um, understanding of, um, of the field. And uh, the other 36 credits uh, is allocated to dissertation. So as you can imagine, um, uh, the dissertation is, uh, is one of the main milestones uh, in the program. And um, um, you will have, uh, you will have uh, two years in order to complete a research project and write up uh, your, your thesis. Um, some of the potential uh, career uh, prospects uh, for our PhD graduates are uh, faculty members in academia. And this is very common that those with PhD degrees um, can apply for academic uh, positions um, at universities. Uh, but this is not the only uh, possible future career. Um, graduates also can work as uh, researchers, usually in, in the position of postdocs uh, related to some research uh, grants uh, in research centers, but also in other uh, uh, research uh, organizations. And also they can assume uh, uh, positions in uh, government and non-government um, organizations. Um, so if you have developed a passion uh, for uh, PhD and interdisciplinary PhD in humanities and social sciences, uh, we very much uh, welcome you to apply uh, to our PhD program. And um, as uh, my colleagues also stated, uh, we would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nahidi, for your informative information. Uh, before we proceed to the admissions, I would like again to remind you that if you have any question you would like to ask, please share them using the Q&A tab on the lower side of the web screen by clicking on the three dots. Please direct these questions to all panelists to make sure that your questions are visible to all of us. And then we will address as many as questions we can during the Q&A session that will follow later. So now, uh, most importantly, we will talk about admissions and application requirements. Application process and requirements for MA, eligibility, bachelor's degree from recognized institution in a relevant field, high academic records, high level of proficiency in English, high level of proficiency in Arabic. Now, this requirement is only for the, for the applicants who's applying for MAs in translation studies and audiovisual translation. The requirements, you have to fill and complete an online application through our website. You have to score a minimum of 3.0 GPA or equivalent in your bachelor's degree. Submit a grading scale from your university if your bachelor's degree doesn't follow a 4-point GPA scale. And then you'll have to submit your personal statement, your CV, and then your identification documents. You have to submit a test score of 79 in TOEFL or minimum of 6.5 in IELTS. Uh, now, this is also mandatory for MA in Translation Studies and Audiovisual Translation. This requirement can be waived for MAST programs if you've completed your studies at a university in a country where English is the native language. If, if you provide an official letter confirming that you obtain your degree from a university where the medium of instruction is English, or if your first language is English. Uh, as I have said, for math and maths, you will be assessed on your academic um, Arabic language skills during the admissions interview and through a written assessment. Also, I'd like to highlight the dates on the right part of the slide. So the deadline for the Qataris and residents will be on March 15th. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we also mentioned our email address here, admissions.cshss.hpko.edu.qa, and you can call our landline 
4454-6374 or 4454-7138, which I'll be added later in the chat box. Now let's proceed to the process uh, application of PhD program. Same thing, we have the eligibility bachelor's and master's degree from a recognized institution in a relevant field, high academic records, and high level of proficiency in English. Requirements, again, you have to fill and complete an online application through our website. You have to score a minimum of 3.0 GPA or equivalent in your bachelor and master's degree. Submit a grading scale from your university if your bachelor or master's degree does not follow a four point uh, GPA scale. And then uh, your personal statement, submit your CV, your identification documents, and submit a test score of 79 in TOEFL or minimum of 6.5 in IELTS. Again, this requirement can be waived if you've completed your studies at the university in a country where English is the native language, or if you will provide a letter confirming that you obtain your degree from a university where the medium of instruction is English or if your first language is in English. And also, this is the most essential part for the PhD program. You have to submit two recommendation letters. And then last but not least, you have to submit your research proposal. Uh, so if you have any questions, just click on the three list and we will answer all of those later. Now let's talk about scholarships and tuition fees. So as for our tuition fees, you can find them also listed online on our website at hbko.edu.qa/chss. Please note that the degree is built on a credit hour basis depending on the number of credits done in a given semester. Also, a payment plan can be arranged to spread out payments for this degree. Scholarships. And next, uh, we will talk about scholarships. The college provides opportunities for scholarships on a competitive basis. Once you submit your online application, you are automatically enrolled to the scholarships opportunities. No application needs to be submitted. There is no um, specific link for you to apply for the scholarship. We offer scholarship and tuition waivers ranging from 50 to 75%, and students have to declare this at the time of the application using the online form. Scholarships and tuition waivers will be given based on academic merit, excellence, and financial aid. And last but not least, students awarded with scholarship or tuition waivers should adhere to the scholarship policy, which includes enrolling as a full-time student and maintaining an average GPA of 3.25. Uh, so this concludes our session for today. I'd like to remind you again, for your questions, you can click the three dots on the lower uh, bottom part of your uh, computer so we can uh, all see the question. Okay, so we have a question for Dr. Mehdi. Um, from Mustab Shira Janat, please elaborate on funding or scholarship for PhD program? Yeah, um, for <clears throat> residents and Qatari students, uh, for those um, who meet the requirements, uh, they will be invited to an interview session. And if their interview is also successful and they are uh, uh, admitted into the program, usually uh, there is a 50% uh, tuition fee waiver. From Amina Akeshi, greetings. What is the maximum number of students allowed per class in MA programs? Uh, Dr. Steven. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Charlene. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, basically, uh, the uh, as a graduate program, we typically aim for um, up to around about uh, ten to fifteen students in our classes to run. So it's a very personalized attention. Um, it, in in previous years, it has gone up to just under 20 students, but roughly speaking, we aim to aim between 10 to 15 students in the in the classroom, and 15 is kind of like the the ideal amount. So it's a uh, it's it's a small grouping, it's personalised attention, and uh, that's the way actually how you can get a very enriching learning experience given the uh, the small uh, class space that we actually adopt. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. 
Um, another question with regards to PhD program. Is there a scholarship for PhD, uh, PhD program for the Qatar residents in the college? Uh, I can answer this. For the scholarship, we give scholarship regardless of the nationality, residents, international, and Qataris. So again, as I have mentioned earlier, we give scholarships based on academic merits, um, financial needs, and all the other criteria that we need to um, review through. Is there a minimum from Amina Akeshi again? Is there a minimum score requirement for the sections of IELTS or TOEFL? Uh, it is mentioned in our website. If you click on the academic uh, review, also as I have mentioned, if you're applying for masters in audiovisual translation and translation and studies, I felt uh, IELTS or TOEFL are required. For for the minimum score of IELTS, you should you should have score with a minimum of six point five. And TOEFL IBT with a minimum score of 79. Yeah, are there any more questions? Okay, from Zainab Idris. Is there any possibility that one can get 100% scholarship? Uh, Dr. Steven, maybe we can uh, answer this. Can you repeat the question? Is there any possibility that one can get 100% scholarship? Uh, yes, there is. Um, and uh, it really depends. We have um, two types. We have three types of scholarship in the college. The first one is a, <clears throat> a tuition fee waiver. Uh, which we provide to those who are locally based um, and uh, it can go up to 100% uh, in terms of the tuition fee waiver. We also have a regular international uh, um, scholarship for uh, international applicants um, and uh, again the tuition fee waiver can actually uh, uh, go from 75 to 100% but we also have a conflict zones um, uh, scholarship for, com for students coming from a conflict zone. So if they're coming from a, uh, a, a a country where there is conflict per the World Bank listing, then that would also give a 100% scholarship. I think the key thing to emphasize is that our scholarships are competitive. There's a, there is a limited number, um, so it's a very fierce competition for it. Um, but nevertheless, the scholarships that are provided are very generous. Um, so I encourage you to apply, put yourself forward, and um, and. Uh, after the process of selection, which will involve an interview, if you're selected, then you'll be able to get a scholarship which should cover your needs. Thank you, Dr. Steven. We have one question from Elham. If my GPA is lower than three, can I apply for the MA? I can address that if you wish, Charlene. Um, uh, it is possible to, I still encourage you to apply. And uh, this depends on your, profile as a student. Um, our minimum requirements are a GPA of 3.0, but if you are um, slightly under and you can make a case as to the uh, provide us the reasons why your GPA is lower or if there's um, other aspects in your professional profile, uh, for example, the work experience you have or the publications you've achieved, which uh, can show relevance to the degree, then there could be a case that you could be considered for conditional admission. These are exceptional. This is not really the norm and only a very, it's uh, infrequent that such students can be accepted, but there is still a chance for you. But it really depends on the case and profile that you can actually put forward. For the, such a case, I would recommend that you get in contact with Charlene, bring it to her attention, and then we can look at it in more detail. And it, they're dealt with on a case by case basis. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Just to clarify with Amina regarding your question for the IELTS and TOEFL, no, uh, we don't check like uh, per the category, we check on the overall score. So as I have said, 6.5 should be the overall score, minimum score from IELTS, and 79 for TOEFL. Are there any more questions? Okay, from Taima, I will be graduated hey. by July 2023. Shall I apply now or wait after graduation? Um, 
So as I have said earlier, we have the we have the residents and local deadline this coming March. I would encourage you to still apply um, because some other applicants they apply the temporary certificate as long as they already have the overall GPA and they will provide all the other requirements. So it will be reviewed by our team and admissions. And then once you get through the initial process, we'll also be contacting for you to provide uh, this um, important uh, documents, required documents. Sorry, Charlene, I think uh, there are two questions related to our PhD program. Uh, mm -hmm. One by Mustafshira, uh, who asked, um, whether those who graduate from HBKU colleges um, are at advantage uh, compared to other applicants, uh, the answer is no. Um, the admission is merit-based um, in the sense uh, that uh, uh, first the applications will be screened for compliance uh, purposes uh, to ensure that the requirements that uh, Charlene talked about are met and secondly, uh, they are screened uh, in terms of the proposed uh, uh, project and uh, the research pro uh, proposal, as well as uh, the other documents. And then um, uh, those uh, who uh, pass this uh, screening, uh, they will be invited to the uh, interview sessions. And then the interview uh, sessions uh, uh, will be finalized and uh, those uh, who are considered uh, as uh, potential um, and eligible PhD students uh, will be uh, offered uh, admission. Uh, the other uh, question uh, that was raised was uh, uh, whether GRE is required. Um, I would say no, um, only uh, language requirement. And finally, uh, Mary has uh, asked the question, how many international students do you admit uh, in the PhD program um, uh, per year? And are there any factors that affect uh, the numbers in particular? Um, again, as I said before, um, our admission system is merit-based. Uh, um, and also considering the uh, uh, supervision availability and uh, quota. Um, so uh, number of, uh, um, uh, number of uh, students admitted to our PhD program varies across years. Um, one year, for example, we admitted uh, nine PhD students. Another year, we admit five uh, PhD students. Um, it uh, two main factors that uh, determine this number is number one availability of uh, uh, supervision capacity and uh, 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 workload of our faculty and the other one is uh, uh, how strong the applications are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehdi. Uh, one last question. Is deadline for non qatari is done for PhD? It was mentioned first Feb. So let me clarify this one. The deadline that was over on February 1st was for the international applications. Now for the residents in Qatari, the deadline will be on March 15. Residents in Qatari. One last question. Full time means I cannot work while doing the PhD. This is the question. Uh, to Dr. Mehdi, is full time means I cannot work while doing the PhD? Ideally, uh, would like our PhD students um, to be full time involved uh, in uh, their programs. But uh, realistically, uh, our PhD students uh, work. Um, some of them have part time work. Uh, some of them uh, might have uh, full time work as well. Um, another flexibility of our programs um, at HBKU is that uh, um, the courses are scheduled um, in the afternoon from four on. Um, so um, while we encourage students in case it is possible to concentrate on their studies, uh, but we understand that uh, uh, um, you know um, earning uh, money for our lives is also a necessity. So. 
it it's up, uh, all up to students to manage uh, their study and work. Thank you, Dr. Mehvi. I guess one last question. How long does it take to get a feedback for the quest of potential supervisor? Uh, Dr. Steven, maybe you can uh, answer this. Uh, yes, I mean, I think this is, uh, um, you're referring to the PhD uh, um, application. Um, basically, the applications are ongoing uh, now and they're currently under review. So we encourage you, if you haven't applied already, to apply as soon as possible. Uh, you can, of course, um, uh, contact, um, look at our faculty website, as uh, Dr. Metti highlighted, and look at the profiles, the research expertise of the faculty. And you can engage with the, the, those faculty and uh, send them an email and uh, um, have a and see whether there is a, um, whether your area of proposed research would fit into their areas. And you can also look at the research clusters within the college on our website because that also shows some of the key priority areas that we're focused on. Of course, if you were to propose a PhD topic which relates to those clusters, this makes it even more likely that you will be able to have uh, a suitable supervisor. So. Um, please uh, take that into consideration. But in terms of when you're here, um, it, the review is currently un underway and uh, we're hoping to start um, making decisions uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Uh, before we end the session, there's one last question from Nadia. Is there an option for deferral for your entry? And also one more question, if we start and I will be moving outside Qatar, is there any transferring for my credit hours to any other universities? Uh, I think Dr. Steven, you can also answer this one regarding the transfer of credit hours. Okay, well, firstly, I'll just, I'll just deal with the uh, deferral. Um, yes, the universe, if you are accepted onto um, one of our degree programs, it is possible to apply for a one semester deferral. However, it only applies uh, it, sorry, it does not apply in the case of the MA in Translation Studies and the MA in Audiovisual Translation because the nature of the courses, sequences that students take doesn't allow for a deferral. But in the other programs um, that we offer, it is possible to take a uh, one semester deferral. Um, and in terms of the uh, second question, um, if you were to start a degree at HBKU, and um, uh, complete a semester, you will earn credit hours. Now, if you, if I understood correctly, you're proposing to potentially move to a different university and take credits with you. Then it will be up to the university you go to whether they would accept uh, uh, credit hours uh, transfer as part of the degree you would go to if you're accepted. But likewise, if you are, if you've been, uh, the reverse applies to HBKU. If you've previously been on a on an aligned uh, master's or a PhD program, it is possible to do transfer credits to a limited number to HBKU. But of course, these are um, these are subject to assessment uh, by the uh, by the, the relevant programs, and so it's not guaranteed. It, it has to be shown that they're above a certain grade and relevant to the program. If that's the case, then uh, they can be uh, a limited number can be transferred. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. I keep on saying last, but one last question from all the um, attendees. Can we apply the exam reservation date instead of the IELTS certificate? Uh, so again, um, for the math and maths up to applicants, it is required for you to submit an IELTS certificate. Now, if you're applying for the other programs, English confirmation from your university would be enough. Uh, so we don't have any questions now. I think we can conclude the session at this point. Thank you very much for, for all your questions, and I hope you learned from it. And uh, I wish you best of luck. If you need anything, uh, you can drop us an email, or you can even call us in our landline. So um, thank you, and have a good day to everyone. Thank you.